research in a really important area. So the team um, in WA have done some amazing work um, and are really leading the way in what we know about um, Indigenous peoples and um, the presentation of applied communication disorders. So what we know is um, you know, based largely from the Western Australian setting um, with relatively small groups of Indigenous people, Aboriginal people who have participated in interviews and also a very large um, hospital and mortality um, data analysis that's been undertaken. But we do know that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are extremely diverse. So they're diverse in relation to geography and culture and also language as well. So if we step across to our side of the world, over in Queensland here, so Queensland population, so 64% of our Torres Strait Islander populations reside in Queensland and around 25% of our Aboriginal populations um, reside in Queensland as well. So to date there's been no study undertaken um, in the Queensland setting that's looked at um, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander stroke and traumatic brain injury presentations into the acute hospital setting and also then what the speech pathologists do and what sort of services they provide in those um, acute hospital settings. And there hasn't been any Torres Strait Islander um, data collected, so I'm really happy to report that I've been able to um, present or collect some of that data. So the broad aim then was really to examine the clinical profiles of adult um, Indigenous stroke and traumatic brain injury admissions, and also then the subsequent documented speech pathology services um, that were provided to these patients at a regional Queensland hospital. So what I did was basically um, a retrospective chart audit, so over two years, um, of all of the admissions um, of peoples who identified as being of Aboriginal and or, or both Torres Strait Islander descent um, and using those principal acute diagnoses of those ICD um, codes there related to stroke and also brain injuries. <coughs> so within that data collection period, over that two year period, there's 138 stroke and traumatic brain injury admissions during that period. So 115 of those peoples identified as Aboriginal and not Torres Strait. Um, 11 identified as being both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent, and then 12 um, identified as being of just Torres Strait Islander um, descent. So we do know that within those populations there's incredible diversity. Um, if we look at stroke and brain injury admissions, it was almost 50-50, um, but there were more men, more males presented with, um, or who were admitted with brain injury, and then slightly more females um, were admitted due to stroke. So of those 70 traumatic brain injury admissions, if we look at the statistics of particularly cognitive communication disorders, we could, you know, we could say that around 68 of those patients were likely to have presented with at least one acquired communication disorder. And if we take that 30% um, kind of average of people who present with aphasia after stroke, probably around 20 of those patients were likely to have presented with aphasia. Length of, length of stay stats. So for stroke, the median length of stay was eight days. For traumatic brain injury, the median length of stay was 11 days. And if you're aware of at least stroke, um, for all Australian populations, the average length of stay is 21 days. The big difference there already, just with those length of stay stats. So lots of questions then, you know, we start to think about are we potentially discharging or are these patients potentially being discharged or stepped down back to other centres without comprehensive um, assessment and access to rehab services. We think about the diversity of these patients. So this is a um, diagram here, if you've never seen this diagram before, this is part of the um, Indigenous language groups of Australia. So I've just got a snapshot there of a little bit of Queensland and also the Northern Territory. And all of the little red dots are where the patients where their home location was. So patients were from 26 different locations across Queensland and the Northern Territory, and this included 10 different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as well. So the vast majority of peoples were from outer regional areas, but there's also a significant number from remote and very remote localities as well. So if we look at the language groups there, um, and where these peoples are from, very high possibility that standard Australian English is not the first language, so potentially a lot of these people are bilingual and potentially multilingual as well. And when you get into the charts, every patient, their background, their language background was recorded as English only. So that's pretty interesting. 
when you delve into the charts and have a little bit of a look at what speech pathologists are doing, primarily at, for assessment purposes for communication, um, communication is primarily assessed using informal kind of observation um, approaches and it's usually undertaken um, in conjunction with dysphagia assessment. So that's initial assessment but also subsequent assessments as well. And that's probably not too different to what happens with long populations or other populations as well. And the determination of whether or not someone has an acquired communication disorder is usually undertaken in one to two reviews. If assessment tools were used, they are primarily either a, lang a locally developed language screener or the good old regulars, the old Sheffield pops up, um, the bedside lab, um, and also the Mount Gorga popped up there as well. So the thing to remember about assessment tools is that we don't have any culturally appropriate, currently we don't have any culturally and linguistically appropriate um, tools for these populations to use in Australia. So in the absence of those tools, speeches are obviously using some other tools as well. Dysarthria was the most commonly um, diagnosed acquired communication disorder. Um, and then when we look at aphasia and also high level language disorders, these were rarely diagnosed. So that's probably you know, not groundbreaking news because we don't have you know, realistically culturally appropriate tools to be able to make a, you know, an informed diagnosis. And when I go through the charts, um, there's no, well there hasn't been any documentation in the charts of any kind of cultural or linguistic adaptations that have been made to that assessment process. When we look at intervention, patients rarely receive speech pathology intervention for acquired communication disorders. And when you look at those length of stay studies, <coughs> that's probably one of the reasons why. If intervention was provided, um, generally it took on that more functional approach, such as conversation and everyday reading. Um, and I've got a little tick there because when you look at the literature, using those functional approaches is likely to be more culturally appropriate rather than the standard kind of therapies. And as well, there was no documentation in the chart, in the chart of any um, cultural or linguistic adaptations to these uh, interventions. So a few key discussion points there. So those patients really are from a diverse geographical location. And, and the reason for that is where the um, research site is. It's a catchment area for a large proportion of Queensland. So potentially a lot of those people experienced incredible dislocation from home and family and community and country. So that potentially has um, flow on effects for quality of life and well-being, and then that need to want to um, potentially be discharged. Um, the majority of patients, 84%, identified as Aboriginal, but we know that across and within just that Aboriginal um, population there is that incredible diversity. And we know um, about language as well and linguistic diversity. So potentially many of these peoples would have been bilingual or multilingual and their primary language was recorded in IEMR as English only. And as I've mentioned, shorter length of stay. So I think that needs a little bit more investigation there. And there's probably many reasons for that shorter length of stay. So only eight days for stroke. Um, potentially that's an impact there of that geographic diversity when the big acute hospital is wanting to push back to other health services and back to community and get um, people discharged out of that service. Um, and then that query still remains then, well, what's happening when they get discharged to these areas? And you saw on the map in some of those cases, in some of those locations, there is no speech pathology um, service available. And you know, are these people being discharged without that comprehensive assessment and access to um, rehabilitation services? These informal approaches to assessment and intervention are likely to be much more culturally appropriate. Um, however, are we comprehensively assessing particularly language ability? So are we actually comprehensively assessing reading and writing? Or are we just focusing on the spoken form? Um, we know that a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples use a lot of gesture and body language. How are we going about assessing those kind of elements as well and that form of communication and pragmatic skills? And are we doing that in the most culturally appropriate manner? Are we doing this in, y in yarning circles? Do hospitals have access to these kind of facilities? Also time factors as well. So there's some nice literature that talks about that to do 
um, intervention or assessment and intervention with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples takes more time. It's a lot more time, time to develop trust, to rapport, um, to to do that properly, work with families, it takes a lot more time. So we know that in the acute hospital setting, occasions of service is the thing that drives um, a lot of funding. So is time a potential problem here as to why we aren't assessing and providing appropriate intervention? And what resources are available in those acute hospital settings that we um, might be able to employ? So some of those resources are already there that we might be able to access and use a lot better. Um, to provide some services or some enhanced services. So how can we work better with Indigenous liaison officers or Aboriginal liaison officers if they're in place? How do we work better with family members, um, particularly for a lot of these people who've been dislocated from home? Um, sometimes they're arriving <coughs> in acute um, hospital settings without an escort or without a family member, and it can be a couple of days sometimes until a fam at least one family member um, can actually arrive at that main um, setting. Can we look at using some cultural mentors? And also advocacy for interpreter services. So at least in Queensland, we don't have any access to um, qualified interpreter services for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. Um, and at least with Queensland Health, the way Queensland Health works is that if you don't um, submit a request for a language, they don't know that there's a need. And at the particular um, data collection site, over the last two and a half years, there's only been one request made for an Indigenous language. So I would strongly encourage, if you don't have access to those services, the more you request them, the more um, knowledge is out there about you know, if there's actually needs to be a need for this service. So some limitations, um, although it's the first study kind of exploring some of these clinical profiles, the data was collected from a single site, but there is um, a nice rich data set. Documentation limitations, of course, so it doesn't, there's only so much you can write in a chart, doesn't accurately um, or sufficiently, sufficiently account for time factors and the reasoning and collaboration processes that go on. And at the moment, there's no standard um, or no direct comparisons to standard practice. So of course, we need to further explore um, diversity, um, have a look at those factors, particularly around length of, st length of stay and that step down process and really developing a better understanding of how these applied communication disorders might actually present in these really diverse populations as well so that we can provide culturally responsive.